text this morning is Psalm 135, what we just sang. These are the words of God. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the name of the Lord. Praise him, O ye servants of the Lord. Ye that stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises unto his name, for it is pleasant. For the Lord hath chosen Jacob unto himself, and Israel for his peculiar treasure. For I know that the Lord is great, and that our Lord is above all gods. Whatsoever the Lord pleased, that, that did he in heaven, and in earth, in the seas, in all deep places. He causeth the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He maketh lightnings for the rain. He bringeth the wind out of, the, out of his treasuries. Who smote the firstborn of Egypt, both of man and beast. Who sent tokens and wonders into the midst of the O Egypt, upon Pharaoh, and upon all his servants. Who smote great nations and slew mighty kings. Sion, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan, and all the kingdoms of Canaan, and gave their land for an heritage, an heritage unto Israel, his people. Thy name, O Lord, endureth forever, and thy memorial, O Lord, throughout all generations. For the Lord will judge his people, and he will repent himself concerning his servants. The idols of the heathen are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Neither is there any breath in their mouths. They that make them are like unto them, so is everyone that trusteth in them. Bless the Lord, O house of Israel. Bless the Lord, O house of Aaron. Bless the Lord, O house of Levi. Ye that fear the Lord, bless the Lord. Blessed be the Lord out of Zion, which dwelleth at Jerusalem. Praise ye the Lord. Our Father and gracious God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to hear it. We thank you for the opportunity to sit under the instruction of the word. I pray that your Holy Spirit would take full advantage of this in our lives and in our families. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This psalm is untitled, and it is truly a, a curious composition. It's a scriptural mosaic. Most of this psalm is laid together like tiles from other portions of scripture. One scholar has said that, quote, every verse in this psalm either echoes, quotes, or is quoted in some other part of Scripture. So in order to uh, enjoy the psalm, in order to appreciate the fullness of the psalm, you have to be a Bible reader. If you're, if you're saturated in Scripture, you're going to notice the allusions. You're going to say, oh, that's from here, and that's from there, and that's from this other uh, place. Allusions are, are lost on the person who just comes to Psalm 135 cold and, and doesn't know the rest of the Bible. This psalm, uh, uh, this psalm in verse 5 is citing Exodus 18, 11. In verse 7, it's citing Jeremiah 10, 13. In verses 15 through 18, it's almost verbatim with Psalm 115, 4 through 8. Verse 13 draws on Exodus 3, 15. Verse 14 is drawing on Deuteronomy 32, 26 and more. This psalm is a collage from other places, which then stands alone in its own right as, a, as a, uh, a work of worthy praise to God. But you're not going to get the fullness of it. You're not going to understand everything this psalm is doing unless you understand how it's resonating with other portions of Scripture. So the first portion of this psalm is a series of exhortations to praise God with various reasons for this praise being given verses 1 through 14. The following section is the condemnation of idols and idolatry, verses 15 through 18. And then the last section returns to the praise of Yahweh, verses 19 through 21. So let's take this, uh, go through this step by step and consider what it's saying. Those who serve God in the house of the Lord are charged to praise him as he is good and it is pleasant to praise him. That's what we have in the first three verses. God should be praised because he chose Jacob for himself and he placed Israel in his own jewelry box. That's verse 4. And make a note of that. Because we're going to return to that comment uh, later. God is to be praised because no other God compares to him. Verse 5. He is no effeminate God. He does whatever he pleases anywhere. Verse 6. He's no effeminate God. And by that, I mean, I mean that he takes initiative. He is the God of evaporation lightning and wind, verse 7. But he's also a political God. So it's notice in verse 7, he's the God of nature, 
He's the Lord of evaporation, lightning, and wind, but he's also a political God. He's the one who struck the firstborn of Egypt, man and beast alike, verse 8. He not only threw down Egypt, but he also sent tokens and wonders to Pharaoh, verse 9. In other words, God, not only did God destroy Egypt, but he gave Pharaoh ongoing commentary while he was doing it. So he, he did it in stages, and he present, you know, Moses kept coming back to him, will you let my people go? Will you let my people go? Will you let my people go? And God says, all right, let's take the next step. And Pharaoh hardened his heart, and we're also told, as we'll see later in the psalm, God also, it's also true that God hardened his heart. The Lord destroyed great Canaanite nations, and he gave that land to Israel, verses 10 through 12. Sion um, of the Amorites was a giant. Og, king of Bashan, was a giant. We're told how big his bedstead was in in Scripture. He was a giant. These were uh, gigantic peoples, and yet the Lord gave Canaan to the Israelites, driving these giants out. God's name is forever, and he will turn back from destroying his own people. That's verses 13 and 14. Uh, not only does God judge the wickedness of surrounding Gentile nations, but there, there were frequent occasions where God's people apostatized, backslid, fell into idolatry themselves, and God would chastise them. And then God relents and turns back and forgives his people. That's verses 13 and 14. Now, idolatry is nothing but wind and vanity, and the service of and it is the service and worship of Tatterdemalion gods. Heathen, heathen idols are made out of metal by men. Men fashion them. Men make them and then bow down to them. And Isaiah goes on at length of what a lunatic operation that is. You make your own god and you cut one, you cut one into the log and use it for firewood to cook your dinner and the other end of the log you make into your god. And uh, we're told in the psalm here that despite their carved mouths and eyes and ears and mouths for breathing, they are dumb, blind, deaf, and lifeless, verses 16 and 17. Those who make them, it says, are just like them. Those who make idols are just like the idols they make, deaf, dumb, blind, and lifeless, verse 18. Those who trust in them are the same. So those who make idols become like the idols, and those who worship the idols become like the idols they worship. We're going to consider that a little bit in more detail in, in just a moment. These gods are just a bundle of infirmities. These gods get to park in the handicap spots. These gods are nothing. They are vanity. Then absolutely everyone who's associated with the Zion of God is summoned to gather back around in order to bless the Lord, verses 19 through 21. We began by blessing the Lord, we end by blessing the Lord. There are two sets of imperatives here having to do with the praise of God, um, verses 1 through 3 and verses 19 through 21 on each end of the psalm. And then there's one imperative in verse 13 in the middle. Uh, this, is a, this is in stark distinction from a lot of modern or contemporary praise music. Think of it like a sandwich. The praise, uh, the, the praise portions are like two pieces of bread. So you've got the piece of bread on one side, then you've got all the meat of the sandwich, and then you've got another piece of bread on the other end of it. Um, modern contemporary worship is often bread sandwiches with very little mayo between the slices of bread. It's just all bread. So you say, what's the song consist of? Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Verse 2, hallelujah, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise Jesus. Verse 3, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. It's just all bread. What, the, what we do in the Psalms is we have a piece of bread. Praise the Lord. Everybody gather around. Everybody praise the Lord. We're going to praise the Lord now. And then on the other end, you have another piece of bread. We conclude with praise the Lord. And then in the middle, you have many verses of meat. You've got, you've got a real sandwich. Why should we praise the Lord? Why should we praise the Lord? And then the psalmist goes in to itemize why we praise the Lord. So we have examples given of, of what, what are the sorts of things that we ought to be praising God for. And we're encouraged to think outside our, our accustomed grooves, right? How, when was the last time you praised the Lord for evaporation? I dare say that you have not. So, what's this God like? What does God do? Well, this is the God we praise, but what, um, 
How, how are we to approach him? With what understanding should we approach him? What does this God do? In this psalm, we're told that God does whatever he pleases, wherever he pleases, whenever he pleases. This applies absolutely everywhere. In verse 6, we're told that the Lord does whatever he pleases in heaven, in earth, in the seas, and down in all the deep places. God does whatever he wants, wherever he wants, and what he wants to do is govern this world that he made. This is the teaching of Scripture throughout all of Scripture. There is no place, there is no square inch in this cosmos anywhere where God is not the Lord of it and in absolute control of what's going on in that space. Nebuchadnezzar knew that this was true. That's in Daniel 4.35. Solomon knew that it was true. That's in Proverbs 16.33. Isaiah vaunted over the false gods on just this point. Isaiah 41.23. He says to the false gods, show us the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that you're gods. Tell, tell me what's going on, he says to the, false, to the idols. You don't know what's going on. God is the God of history. So God is the God of nature. God is the God of the political realm. God is the God of history. God is the God of science. God is the God of lingu uh, linguistics and grammar. God is the Lord of all. The Apostle Paul exulted in the truth of it. In Ephesians 1.11, he works out all things according to the counsel of his own will. God works out everything in accordance with his divine purpose. And his purposes are not arbitrary or capricious or conducted in fits of pique. This is the sovereign wisdom of a father. When we start talking about the sovereignty of God, too many Christians, maybe a bad experience with a dad growing up, maybe... Um, you've just been affected by the slander of unbelievers, we immediately imagine some North Korean dictator tyrant wanting the angels goose-stepping around heaven and dictating everything in, in appalling ways. But this is the sovereign wisdom of a father. This is the wisdom of a father who loves you and who gave his own son to die on a cross in order to secure, in order to secure your salvation. Now, there are times when it does look to us from our vantage point, it looks arbitrary, it looks capricious, it looks like this is a lunatic move. Who's in charge of this world, right? Why, why is this happening now? A wonderful little illustration, I think, that, that uh, governs all of it is that it's living in this fallen world is like living under a loom. Uh, when there's an old southern gospel song that says, farther along will... Know, uh, know all about it. Farther along, we'll understand why. Uh, when we get to glory, when we get to heaven, God's going to bring us up. We're going to look down on the top of the loom, and we're going to see the tapestry that's being woven. We're going to see the pattern. We're going to see what he was up to. We're going to see what that color was doing there, what this thread was doing there. We're going to see. Farther along, we'll know all about it. Farther along, we'll see that. Right now, we're under the loom, and all we're looking at is tangled knots of yarn hanging down, tangled knots of thread. And there's, what's that for? I don't know why that happened. This seems counterproductive to me. You know, why, why would God have, I'm trying to be diligent. I'm trying to be a good Christian. I'm trying to provide for my family. And right now, frankly, is a bad time for the engine of our one car to blow up. This is, this is not, Lord, how I would spend your money. <laughs> and God says, in effect, well, it is how I'm spending it, right? I, I want you to deal with this. I'm, he's doing it because he is a wise father. Whatever happens, whatever happens, he is doing what he does as a sovereign, complete, exhaustively kind, exhaustively good father. So he does whatever he pleases, and what he pleases is good. He does whatever he pleases, and what he pleases is good. So you pick, pick out a typhoon in the middle of the Pacific Ocean somewhere, and pick out, you can arbitrarily pick whatever, whichever one you want. Pick out a raindrop in the middle of that typhoon as it hurtles down toward the ocean. God named that raindrop before the foundation of the world and decreed the precise moment that it would hit the ocean surface. He decreed the number of water molecules that it would contain altogether throughout the course of its existence. He, he decreed the shape and contours of its surface every instant. So you should be of good cheer. You are worth more than many raindrops. And this is the sort of thing, this is how the Lord reasons, right? Birds can't fall to the ground without, uh, apart from the will of the Father. You're worth more than many sparrows. 
What, God clothes the flowers. Why, did, why are you so worked up about whether he's going to clothe you or not? What on earth are you worried about? What on earth are you worried about? Well, I'm not sure that this book is accurate when it talks about how good and wise the sovereign God is. He, he's sovereign enough for me to blame him for everything, but he's not sovereign enough for me to trust in his goodness. It's, but it says in Hebrews, the one who comes to God must believe that he exists, must believe that he is, and that he's the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. If you come to God, you must believe two things about him, that he's there and that he's good. He's there and he's good. The ancient pagans didn't have that blessing. The pagans had to deal with gods that really were arbitrary and capricious, and you had to flatter them, and you had to bribe them, and you had to tiptoe around this, this world, not, uh, tr- attempting not to get on the wrong side of Zeus, or especially Hera. Or you, you didn't want to get on the wrong side of any one of these gods because they really were just overgrown celebrities, stronger and bigger and smarter than we are, but no more godly, no more, there's no ultimate righteousness there. For Christians, God is altogether righteous, altogether kind, altogether good, and altogether sovereign. Altogether sovereign. And that means you can trust him with absolutely everything. You can trust him with everything. So, remember verse 4. Where are you encased? You are contained within God's jewelry box, chosen to reside there. In verse 4, It says this, for the Lord hath chosen Jacob unto himself and Israel for his peculiar treasure. The uh, word that is rendered here is peculiar treasure could be rendered as jewelry box. God has put you in his jewelry box. God has got you in his safe box. Now, when... If your house catches on fire and you get your family out, everybody's out standing on the lawn watching it burn, and you think, I I could get in there, I could get a couple of things out, I still have time to get a couple of things out, Uh, what sorts of things would you get out? Would you run in there and get get all the Kleenex boxes? Would you you risk your life to run in there and get the the nickel uh, waste paper paper basket? No, you'd run in and get the strong box with your important papers in. You you would go in and get the jewelry box. You'd, You'd go get the valuables. You are God's valuables. Now, he didn't choose you because you were valuable. He chose you, and that made you valuable. But you are valuable now, and you are in his jewelry box now, and he is a father, and he's good. He's a father, and he's good. Now, I said earlier, he's the Lord of evaporation. What's with that? The world is not governed by natural law. The world is governed by the words of the Lord Jesus. In him, all things hold together. Colossians 1.17. The reason you stick to the sidewalk when you walk is because Jesus is being kind to you and he wants you to be able to get downtown. That's, that's why you stick to the sidewalk. That's why things don't float off when you put them down on the desk. That's why everything holds together. And you might say, I, I thought it means everything holds together, you know, like spiritually. And some other deity is in charge of the world. No. Jesus is the Lord of this world. He's the Lord of everything. He's the Lord of the physical world. He's the Lord of the spiritual world. He's the Lord of our emotional weather. He's the Lord of all things. In him, all things hold together. He is the one who makes vapors ascend all over the earth. Verse 7, that's where the rain comes from. If there were no evaporation, there'd be no rain. He mixes lightning with the rain, verse 7. He has treasuries where he, where he stores the winds, and he brings the winds out whenever it suits him. Psalm 148, his stormy winds that do his pleasure. But whether we're talking about natural processes or whether we're talking about the rise and fall of kingdoms and empires, we are always talking about the activity of the one true Jehovah God. Always. Now, you might say, but I don't know why he would do that. Well, yeah, right. But that's why you weren't put in charge of that. Right? God has it under control. And when we gather before him, when we are shown the vast panorama of human history, and we all look at it, we're going to see that is the best story we've ever heard. That was the best way to do it. There, is no other, there, there would have been no other better way to do it because if, if there had been a better way to do it, God would have done it that better way. So we are always talking about the activity of Jehovah God. This is the God who selected Jacob, verse 4, who upended Pharaoh, 
Verse 9, who speaks to the water vapors as they rise. Verse 7, who saw to it that Og, king of Bashan, was thrown down. Verse 11, and who chastises his own people. Verse 14, when they go astray. This is all the same God. This is the one true God. This is, we, we don't have a uh, polytheistic system where we have a God of politics and he's the deist God, and we have a God of um, your emotional life, and that's a pantheist God, and we have a God of salvation, and that's the Jesus God. God is not divvied up. It's all one God. We believe in one true God, only one God. This is all the same God, the only true God, and that means that nothing you have seen on the news this week is outside of his control. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Nothing. You might say, you mean Russia and Ukraine? Yes, Russia and Ukraine. You mean what they're doing in Washington, D.C. right now? Yeah, that too. You mean all the plots and schemes that, we just sang Psalm 2 this morning, the plots and schemes that they cook up, what, what does God do? In heaven, he laughs. He laughs. Because everything is, is calculated by him to wend toward his perfect outcomes. What was the worst thing that ever happened in the history of our planet? The worst thing that ever happened in the history of our planet was the railroading, the miscarriage of justice, the judicial murder of the Lord Jesus Christ. Or put another way, your salvation. That was the worst thing. <laughs> you, wait, wait, wait. The worst thing that ever happened in the history of the world was my salvation? Yeah, that's exactly right. The Lord Jesus was crucified. What, is, what does it say in in Acts chapter 4 about this. What, what did God do in the, self, in, in the execution of Jesus? The kings of the earth. The kings of the earth stood up, verse 26, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. Fat lot of good it did them. For of a truth against thy holy child, Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. Herod had his purpose. Pilate had his purpose. Judas had his purpose. They all had their various purposes. But what was God's purpose? To bring you home to glory. That was God's purpose. And God used the worst thing ever to bring you home to glory. Now, if God can do that with the worst thing, do you think that he can work with the bad time that you're having on a Tuesday? You, you've, I've, this, is a, this is a bad Tuesday. I'm telling you, I didn't get a parking spot. and my, It's a bad hair day and, and, and things are going wrong and my teenager was mouthing off. and it's a bad, It was kind of churny. You know? It was a bad thing. I don't see how God could do that. I can see how he would take the worst judicial murder ever and save the world with it, but I don't see how he, how he could use my rotten Tuesday. Well, step outside, take a few deep breaths of air, Think about that for a minute. Nothing, nothing that happens to you is outside the, the sovereign control of a loving father. And so you have to trust him. You have to trust his character because you don't see it. You can't see it. But do any of you dads or moms, have you ever had to say to your two-year-old when they've, they just got into the why question, you know, why are we doing this? Why why is it taking so long to drive to our vacation spot? Are we there yet at the end of the driveway? Are we there, are we there yet? Have you ever had to say, you're just going to have to trust me? I, you can't understand. I, I could give you the explanation, but you can't understand it now. You're just going to have to trust me. God is saying that to us all the time. Just trust me. Trust, trust Jesus. Trust God. Trust the Spirit. Now, here's a great principle I think that is driving all of this as we're learning how to trust him. How do we learn how to trust him? Well, this passage, this Psalm 135, quotes Psalm 115. Idolaters shape idols in their own image. So when someone comes up with the idea to worship a created thing, and they could do it in the abstract, Paul says covetous men are idolaters because they don't, they don't light candles in front of their bank book, but they're, in effect, idolaters. Uh, and then someone might carve a statue and bow down to it, leave baskets of fruit in front of it, and say prayers to the ultimate Almighty through, through means of this image. There's something crooked or bent in the heart of the idolater when he takes the step of making that idol. But that's not the end of the process. 
Idolaters shape idols in their own image, and then those idols shape the worshipers into something even more misshapen. If you carve a cruel god, and then you start worshiping a cruel god, the end of the road is you're going to be even more cruel. If you carve a god of lust, and then you start worshiping the god of lust, the end result is you're going to become increasingly lustful. This is because the biblical principle, this is a theme throughout all scripture, we become like what we worship. We become like what we worship. We see this principle here with regard to idolatry. If you worship a deaf, dumb, and blind God, you're going to become deaf, dumb, and blind. If you believe that ultimate reality is chaos, which is what um, all materialistic uh, naturalism has to do, it's just atoms banging around. There's no God over it. There's no purpose over it. If you believe in ultimate material chaos, your life is going to become increasingly chaotic. You're going to become like what you worship. You, if, the, the reason our nation is descending into anarchy is because we are worshiping anarchistic gods or multiple gods who can't agree. So we become like what we worship. We see this principle with regard to idolatry, but it's also the true driver of our sanctification. This is how we grow in grace. This is how we're supposed to grow in grace. 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, now are we sons of God, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall become like him, for we shall see him as he is. What will it, what will it be that will transform us into the ultimate likeness of Jesus Christ? Well, John says here, what will transform us finally and completely into the final likeness of Jesus Christ is seeing Jesus Christ. When you see Jesus Christ fully and completely, as we will do at his second coming, we're going to become like Jesus Christ. But this process is not just a definitive moment at the second coming when we see the Lord. It's also a week-to-week, day-to-day process. What does Paul teach in 2 Corinthians 3.18? He says, but we all, with open face, no masks, open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. We are being transformed from glory to glory, and what is it that transforms us from glory to glory? It's looking at glory, worshiping glory, coming coming into the presence of the glory. So when we come into the presence of glory and we sing praises to the glory, we are be, we're being made glorious. We all with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image. God made us in the image of God. We are reflectors. We, are, we, are, we reflect what God is like. If we're, but we are fundamentally reflectors in that if we rebel against him and we point the mirror, we point the reflector at something else, we reflect that. If you, start, if you point the, the mirror at, at a misshapen idol, you're going, to become, you're going to start to reflect that idol. So, not only is it true that we become like what we're worshiping, it is also the case that whatever it is we're becoming is a true indicator of where our heart worship actually is. So we become like what we worship, But it also is true that if we're becoming something, markedly, obviously becoming something, that's a true indicator of where our heart worship is. What do I mean by that? Well, if you have a man who comes to the public worship of the triune God every week, and every week he sings praises to the Lord Jesus Christ, and he reads the scripture, and he sings in the choir, and he says amen at the right places, and he partakes of the bread and wine, and he sits under the preaching of the word. But with every passing month, he gets angrier at home and more sullen at home and more given to fits of rage at home, then you may depend upon it. He has a small carved idol hidden in a closet somewhere. He's got a carved idol that he's worshiping somewhere. It's probably some kind of little angry monkey god. If he becomes increasingly lustful, He's got a little lizard God somewhere. He's got, he's got something set up. Too often, Christians try to deal with sin in a piecemeal way. They, they, want, they, they don't see sins, particular sins, you know, a fit of temper or greediness or, or hurt feelings where it wasn't appropriate. They, they, they see that those things are sins, 
They see that it's bad fruit, but they, they don't want to recognize that there's a tree somewhere. Or there's a tree somewhere. And what is that tree? The tree is the idolatry, the idol. Now, we live in a fallen world. We can worship, Christ, we can worship God the Father through Christ and be tempted by a, you know, a random temptation. I'm talking about a besetting sin. I'm talking about a sin that just, it's the gum on your shoe and it just won't go away. Or, even worse, I'm talking about a sin that you give way to that you think is a virtue. You think it's your virtue. So, you say, you, that's not an idol. That's I, I tore down the idol. But that's just one of the high places. Tore down, yeah, you need to cut the trees down in the high places also. This is because you become like what you worship and what you're becoming like reveals to the world what you're worshiping, what your worship life is really like, what your worship life is really like. Anybody can, anybody can take a shower and put on a jacket and cinch up a tie and show up at church. People can do that. Unregenerate people can do that. But what the unregenerate people can't do is become more and more, more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. They can't do it because their mirror, their reflector is not pointed at him. When you come to worship him, you come to point the, the image, the mirror that you are. You want to reflect the Lord Jesus Christ. And God sees to it that that reflection is an increasing reality in your life. Non Christian, this principle applies to non Christians. They become more like the, what they worship. It applies to hypocritical Christians. They become more like what they're actually worshiping. And it applies to you. It applies to you who've been put in God's jewelry box. You've been set aside. He chose you. He gathered you. He brought you here so that you could face Him, so that you could face the glory. And when you face the glory, you are increasing in glory. What is sin, sin is to fall short of the glory of God. That's what sin is. And salvation is entering into joy, entering into glory. And, and this worship service should be the central driving engine of all your growth in the Lord. This is where we face the Lord collectively together. This is where we, we renew covenant to, with him together. This is where we sing praises to him. And we want to do it with an unfeigned spirit. We want to do it with a whole heart. And when we worship him, when we praise him for all the things he's done in nature and in history and in politics and all these things, and we, we just humble ourselves before him and we face him, we reflect that glory. Our Father, gracious God, we know that Apart from you, we can do nothing, and we know that you have summoned us into your presence so that we may behold your face uh, through the gospel. We, we know that you want us to do this because you want to transform us. So, Father, we would submit to that process. I pray you'd work in us. I pray that you'd topple the idols in us so that we might be transformed the way your word describes. Father, we would lift up to you now the words that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Christ's fulfillment of the Old Testament law isn't the watering down of the law. Christ's fulfilling the law isn't the same thing as the law sort of just petering out. But the propaganda makes it out that Christ's coming ushered in a system in which, in which God yawns at sin, pats us on the head, saying, it's all right, you, you did your best. But this isn't how Scripture would have us understand the fulfillment of the law in Christ. His fulfilling the righteous requirements of the law wasn't the doing away of the law. Rather, his coming was the deepening and broadening of the law by revealing the grace that had been present in the law all along. Israel couldn't keep the holy law, but the God of Israel could, and graciously did so by sending his son in the flesh to redeem those under the law. Christ's fulfillment of the law was like bringing a diamond out into full sunlight. And we partake of this broadening of the Mosaic law here at Christ's table. Gentiles were, of course, prohibited from partaking of the Passover without first becoming Jews. But Christ didn't scrap the Passover. He made it so that all nations might partake of the delivering grace held forth in the Passover. God's wrath fell on Egypt but passed over the Hebrews. In Christ, while God's wrath still falls... It passes over all who have been marked out as Christ's, both to Jew and Gentile. What the law foreshadowed, grace now gives. You cannot earn God's favor by law-keeping, but because you're robed in Christ's righteousness, God reckons you as righteous before his law. 
Moreover, the spirit of righteousness has been sent to dwell within you, that you might desire to keep the law by faith in Christ and receive his regenerating power to do so to the glory of God our Father. And so come in faith and welcome to Jesus Christ. This is the charge. You are a mirror. You were created to reflect. You were created to do that, and you will reflect. So there's no, if, if you say, my, oh, my mirror's busted, it's broken. Well, you can't go down, there's no, there are no gears, there are no levers, there are no cables inside a mirror. Everything, is, everything reduces to what it's pointed at. So what is the mirror pointed at? If it's pointed at some wrong thing, some idol, some carved image, some abstraction, it's going to start, it's going to reflect that. You want it pointed at Christ and Christ alone. So with believing hearts, receive the benediction of your God. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Amen.